And with that, uh, we finally have our, our presentation up available. Perfect. Uh, President Rundell, thank you uh, for your gracious introduction. Dean Litchfield, uh, also. Uh, faculty, uh, my gratitude for confirming my uh, appointment among you. Uh, students, clergy, alums, laity, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to reflect with you as you have been, as we have been reflecting upon the proclamation of the word, uh, to think also about the ordering of the table. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this universe, our great home for its vastness and its riches, and for the manifoldness of the life which teems upon it and of which we are part. We praise you for the arching sky and the blessed winds, for the driving clouds and the constellations on high. We praise you for the salt sea and the running water, for the everlasting hills, for the trees, and for the grass under our feet. We thank you for our senses by which we can see the splendor of the morning and hear the jubilant songs of love. Grant us, we pray, a heart wide open to all this joy and beauty, even in the mid of winter. And save us from being so steeped in worry or darkened by concern that we pass heedless and unseeing when even the thorn bush by the wayside is aflame with the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Well, being new to this community, I'd like to start by sharing just a bit about myself uh, to give you a sense of how I've come to think about Holy Communion uh, in ways that account for issues like land stewardship, like food, community, and economy. I grew up in South Dakota, as President Rundell mentioned, a rural farming state in a part of the country people call the breadbasket of the world, the farm belt or the wheat belt. Both of my parents were raised on farms and in small farming communities up near Eureka, South Dakota, which for many years was known to be the wheat capital of the world. Since my parents are both ordained elders in the United Methodist Church, most summers during annual conference, my brother and sister and I would go up to my uncle's or my grandparents' farm for that week. I have warm memories uh, of those times, helping out with chores, uh, getting itchy playing King of the Hill with cousins on uh, stacks of hay, and at the end of the day, cleaning up and sitting down around the farm table, which usually included a spread of German sausage, grandma's homemade pickles, fried dumplings, and potatoes and greens from grandpa and grandma's garden. What I remember in those early years during the mid to late 70s were small farming communities still getting by okay. I remember the youthful faces of my aunts and uncles who were still making a viable living on their small family farms. Well, after four years of college in Minnesota at St. Olaf, where I majored in religion, and a year in DC working for then uh, Democratic leader Thomas Daschle, I moved back to South Dakota to serve as a licensed local pastor for two small rural congregations out on the open prairie. Doland, population 297, <laughs> and Frankfurt, population 166. Perhaps you know communities like Doland and Frankfurt. This was just over 17 years ago. Going down to the coffee shop, paying visits to parishioners, I heard countless stories about the good old days when Main Street was buzzing with a hardware store next to a cafe, the school had its own football team, and church pews were packed every Sunday with grandparents sitting next to children, sitting next to great-grandparents. Like most of the rural areas in our 
country, these two rural communities were decimated by the farm crisis. Higher costs for newer and bigger equipment, leading to more and more debt, decreased agricultural prices for products, massive governmental subsidies given to large corporate factory farms, led to the collapse not only of rural communities, but an entire way of life. Since I was the son of two ministers, uh, yes, President Rundell, pastoral care did come naturally to me. And so I spent a good deal of my time uh, in Dolan and Frankfurt uh, listening and caring. I also officiated at a host of funerals. Almost all of the deaths, as you can imagine, were due to cancer. And although people didn't openly talk about it, there was an underlying awareness of the connection to the pesticides and herbicides being used on the cropland. So there I was, doing what I could uh, as a pastor to care for these dear people without really any sense of how to address what was happening to their communities, to their landscapes, and ultimately to their bodies. That disconnect and the dissonance that it created within me has no doubt shaped the kind of questions that I have been exploring the past 17 years as an MDiv student, uh, then as a campus chaplain, back for doctoral work, and now as one who teaches within theological education. So here now, a parable. So a sower went out to sow wheat in central North Dakota. His farming operation, though significantly larger than the homestead his great-grandparents settled, is nevertheless considered small. In early May, he purchased seeds from AgriPro Wheat, a subsidiary of Advanta, the sixth largest seed company in the world. On April 1st, with his John Deere tractor and Case IH seed drill, he planted 350 bushels across a thousand acres of land, burning a gallon of diesel fuel per acre. Over the course of the growing season, he applied a combined total of 100 pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus per acre, sprayed 32 pounds per acre of Monsanto's Roundup pesticide per acre, 25 ounces per acre of a rust fungicide, and because there had been a lot of moisture that year, he paid an airplane contractor to spray 25 ounces per acre of a scab fungicide. Now, each spring, the fertilizer runoff from his fields drains into the Missouri River, which then flows down to the Mississippi and down into the Gulf of Mexico, creating dead zones miles and miles and miles wide in the marine ecosystem. The pesticides he applies have been directly linked to rises in asthma, allergies, attention deficit disorder, fibromyalgia, and cancer in both farmers and consumers. And as multiple studies have shown, carbon emissions from modern industrial agriculture are a primary contributor to climate change. Well, in August, he used his John Deere tractor or hot combine to harvest the wheat which he loaded onto his Ford truck to transport to the grain elevator. Ultimately, by the time the grain companies, millers, food retailers, and marketers re were paid, the wheat farmer made approximately five cents on the $2 loaf sold at the grocery store. Although he continues to work between 70 and 80 hours a week and is a diligent and astute farmer, and despite the farm subsidies that support his planting of GMO commodity crops like Roundup Ready corn, even still, one year of unfavorable weather, a severe health crisis in the family, or significant market fluctuations would lead to his bankruptcy. Almost 6,000 miles southeast, in Chile's Copiapo Valley, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard. 
Following General Augusto Pinochet's bloody military coup in 1973, and as part of the liberalization of the Chilean economy, reforms were implemented where lands that had been subdivided and given to peasant farmers previously were returned to wealthy plantation owners. Central to these reforms was the opening of Chilean society to the global market by way of a series of societal shocks recommended by the University of Chicago economist Milton Friedman. Throughout the 70s and 80s, governmental subsidies supporting cash crop agriculture and foreign investments from the U.S. encouraged large landowners to transition from traditional domestic crops for local consumption to grapes and other fruits for export. As a result, wealthy landowners who planted vineyards in Copiapo Valley flourished under Pinochet's oppressive regime, which from 1973 to 1990 tortured its citizens, disappeared political dissidents, and assassinated thousands of Chileans, including especially many peasant leaders. Now, since 1990, Chile's democratically elected governments have tried to temper the massive social inequities caused by export agriculture with tariffs and wealth redistribution programs. But the benefits of economic growth continue to accumulate primarily amongst the large landowners. As a result, more and more small farmers have lost their land and been forced to sell their labor as temporary workers in places like Santiago's Maquiadores or sweatshops. Now, when measured exclusively by GNP indicators, Chile is considered a model of economic reform. In particular, since the 90s, Chile has been the leading exporter of fresh fruit, in the Southern Hemisphere, and a major exporter of wines, grape juice, and grape concentrate. Moving back north, a bit to the east, on a Sunday morning somewhere in central Ohio, a congregation of Protestant Christians is gathered to participate in a communion meal. Following the confession of sins and a litany of thanksgiving, the pastor raises a loaf of bread, bread baked with flour ground from North Dakota wheat, and says, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then lifting up a cup of wine, wine fermented from grapes crushed in Chile, the minister continues, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, how should we describe this communion meal? Would we say it is holy is this a holy communion? God's invitation to join together in holy communion resounds at the very heart of the Christian faith and life. Come and eat, taste and see. Do this in remembrance of me. So this is a really important question. When we gather to eat, are we eating rightly? Are we communing properly? Is our consumption holy? Remember the Apostle Paul's warning to the Corinthian church. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Examine yourselves. And only then eat. Only then drink. 
For all who eat and drink without discerning eat and drink judgment against themselves. Of course, much depends on what is meant by holiness. But let's first look at the word communion. The New Testament word in Greek is koinonia. It has a range of meanings, joint participation, fellowship, sharing, community, unity. So a communion, a koinonia, in the most basic sense, simply means an association or an interconnection of two or more woven together in a common bond. There's nothing necessarily good or bad about a communion per se. We might enter into beneficial or harmful associations with others. Paul here cautions that we not participate koinone in the sins of others, or that we not be partners, koinonus, with demons. So tell me briefly about the relationships, the many relationships that are bound up in the act of eating. With whom are you entering into a partnership? With whom or what are you associating when you bite into an apple, a cheeseburger? A banana. And not just asking a rhetorical question. I'm curious, what, whom would you say? Or what, what are we entering into partnership with? Who are the members? Growers. The growers, the producers, the farmers, the distributors, marketers. the marketers, the brand companies, downtown Chicago, downtown New York, Columbus. Soil microorganisms, wildlife, climate patterns, a whole host of partners we join together with when we eat. As Wendell Berry says, let me switch again, everything happens in concert. Not a breath is drawn, but by the grace of an inconceivable series of vital connections joining an inconceivable multiplicity of created things in an inconceivable unity. Nowhere is this more evident than through the act of eating. Eating is communion. As theologian Norman Wurzba writes, eating is one of the most fundamental processes connecting us to one another and to the world. And so if our eating is disordered, we can be certain that everything else will be disordered as well. So again, this is a really important question. And not just for the foodies among us. When we gather to eat at the altar, around tables in the dining hall, in church basements, at home, when we go out to eat, are these many connections uniting us in fellowships that are holy? I have said that God's call to participate in holy communion abides at the very heart of the Christian faith and life. Let me put it this way. God invites us to share in the feast of holy communion in the whole of life. In accepting this call by participating in holy koinonia, always and everywhere, we discover the true purpose for creation. We find the fullness of life in God. This is the good life, or what my mentor Sally McFaig refers to as the abundant life, spoken of by Jesus in the Gospels. Holy communion is the right and the good and the joyful life. So then, what makes a communion truly holy? Well, let's look at the etymology of the word and note the kinship between the words holy, hallowed, heal, healthy, wholesome, whole. All these words share a common Old English root, holly. Next slide. 
As Jürgen Moltmann says, because holy and whole belong so closely together. What is holy is that which has become whole again. We can then describe holistic thinking as healing thinking because it takes account of the wholeness of that which has been separated and tries to restore that wholeness. So when people talk about whole food, and we're hearing that everywhere in the culture, there's at least an indirect connection then between what people of faith mean by calling something holy. I'm sure there's a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods down the road in Columbus. Is that the same thing as holy foods? For those of us who look to John Wesley, certainly not in all things, but in many things, we understand the mission to spread scriptural holiness across the land to be fundamental to the church's mission. With holiness, for we Methodists, understood to be God's perfect love, in and through which we might become more perfect, more whole, precisely by becoming ever more loving of God, of neighbor, and even for Wesley, of the whole of the non-human creation. By God's love, we become more holy, that is, more loving in the whole of our many relationships. We are going on toward holy koinonia. All right, so now we can ask the question a little differently. When we host youth group Super Bowl parties and serve up boxes of delivered pizza, bags of Doritos, and two-liter bottles of Coke, or Pepsi. <laughs> when we serve up cookies and snack crackers at the vacation Bible school to children who attend. As we pack up brown bag lunches for the homeless with a slab of meat product sandwiched in between two Wonder Bread slices. Are we sharing in the wholeness that is God's love? Are we participating in the healing wholeness of God in and through our relationships with those we are directly serving and all those other neighbors? Well, if you take nothing else from this presentation, perhaps my litany of rhetorical questions will unsettle you just enough to change your VBS menu this next year. Now, it should be clear by now that these issues of food, of eating, of land use are all fundamentally shaped by economy, by political economy. How shall we produce and distribute food? Will everyone have enough to eat? These are basic economic questions. Give us this day our daily bread. So I'm going to shift here and offer a few brief comments about economy before proposing five table practices rooted in the holiness of God. As most of you know, many of you, the English word economy comes from two Greek words, oikos, nomos. Oikos means a household or a home, nomos meaning laws or rules. So in its most basic sense, economy simply means the household rules or the management of the household. Next slide. Oikos is also the root word for ecology or the study of our planetary household and ecumenical, oikos menikost, meaning the inhabited or the shared worldwide household. I would argue that how we address these three interconnected issues raised by these three oikic words, economy, ecology, and the oikumene, or the global household, 
how we address these three issues will determine the kind of future we can express, we can expect for human beings and myriad other life forms. Now, oikonomia, or the management of the household, is the most ancient meaning of the word economy. Aristotle, for example, distinguished oikonomia from crematistics. The one, oikonomia, he described as the management of the material resources of the household for the benefit of all its members over the long run. For Aristotle, this is the true form of economy. The other, crematistics, he said, relates to the manipulation of property and wealth so as to maximize short-term monetary gain for the individual owner. Sound familiar? Well, Aristotle viewed such activities with disdain. But the modern meaning of economics follows this second path. Modern economics, which is just over 200 years old, is focused on the rules or the managerial techniques needed to maximize monetary wealth for the individual as quickly as possible. Modern economics is the art of individual money making, and it's rooted in the belief that self-interest is the most powerful force on earth. The global spread of this logic, referred to sometimes as neoliberalism or free market capitalism or unfettered capitalism, the spread of this logic has resulted in a worldwide web of social, economic, and ecological relationships that are all knit together by self-interest, by self-interested love. In this sense, if I may be provocative, this is my Joel Olstein moment. <laughs> the global economy with the agroeconomy at the center is a kind of unholy communion, presently knitting the world's peoples and places together. A worldwide koinonia that includes, among other things, the ongoing enclosure of the commons or common goods, the fragmentation of communities, the degradation of natural ecosystems, the commodification of nearly every single aspect of life, and the enormous concentration of power and wealth amongst an increasing few. Well, those of us committed to the upbuilding of a more sustainable and just economy a more holy economy that supports the flourishing of all, not just a few, would do well to look to the older meaning of oikonomia. For here, the most basic question is not how can I, a self-interested individual, make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, but rather, how shall we order the household for the benefit of all? or perhaps more poetically, how shall we make a home? Now, at the center of nearly every household is the table, the table. The table or meal gathering is the center, both material and symbolic, around which most all other household activities are organized. And this is true of a family meal, a seminar table in a university, a corporate boardroom, or almost any of the world's religious traditions. It is around a table that our most basic patterns of household life together are determined. And so here at table, I would argue, we encounter the most basic questions of economy. Who gets to sit at the table. This is a question of access. Who has access? What bonds are formed around the table? This is a question about the nature 
of the relationships that are formed? Do the elements served nourish the body? It's a question about health, about the earth. How are the seats arranged? Well, that's clearly a question about power. And then finally, in whose name is the meal blessed? What are the ultimate aims? What is the allegiance which drives this meal practice? So although we don't often think of it this way, these are all questions of economy. And the way in which we answer them determines how our households are ordered, whether at the personal, the congregational, the national, or even global levels. Now, the scriptures are clear that the God of Israel, and the God of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, is deeply invested in the question of how households are managed, about the question of homemaking, about table practices, from the house of Pharaoh to the manna economy in the desert, to the Torah construction instructions concerning the poor. Here I'm thinking of the gleanings, thinking of usury or interest prohibitions, justice for the alien, the widow, the orphan, thinking of the jubilee year. From these to the prophetic criticisms of the monarchs, the prophetic tradition, as we heard this morning, to Jesus' announcement of the inauguration of the divine economy. Throughout the scriptures, God is revealed as a kind of economist. God is a homemaker, working to create the conditions of home for all. And so I would propose that in the household of God that Jesus proclaims and incarnates, centered in particular around a peculiar set of table practices, the five basic questions of economy are answered in a very particular and decisive way. Now let me just say here that before we, we dive in, these are obviously very complex issues. And what we have time for today is really just a very impressionistic survey without getting into all of the possibilities, all of the models that I may suggest. So I'll look forward to continued conversations with you about what this might actually look like. So who gets to sit at the table? Well, the God of Jesus Christ invites everyone. All are welcome, especially the poor, the vulnerable, the excluded. There is more than enough for all. We see this in the feeding of the multitude stories where Jesus hosts a meal, much like the manna meal in the desert, in which it says, all ate and were filled. Theologically, then, the claim is that in Jesus Christ, coming back to holiness, in Jesus Christ, the divine holiness is revealed as gracious love for all. And the table commandment issued in one of the banquet parables is this. Go, therefore, and invite everyone you find. So to be faithful to this command, to follow Jesus today, means first of all criticizing any arrangement of the household that excludes people from the basic access to the means of life. Amen. Many in the environmental and food justice movements point to the enclosure of lands as emblematic. This has happened worldwide over the last 200 years. But thinking about our context, in the United States, although the large majority of the citizens early were farmers, today less than 1% of the American population is engaged in farming the land. And that number is expected to drop. 
Frederick Kirschman, who teaches at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture at Iowa State University, writes, in Iowa, for example, it is now being suggested that farms of the future will consist of 225,000 acre industrial complexes. It is being argued that it will be necessary to consolidate farms into such industrial behemoths to gain access to markets and to negotiate effective prices with input suppliers. This transformation would reduce the number of farms, if we can call them that, in Iowa to 140. As with other industrial complexes, labor will consist largely of minimum wage earners. I think we can predict something of the uh, type of workers that will be employed in such industrial complexes. Now, I'm not meaning to overly romanticize farming, even though I started with warm and fuzzy tales about grandpa and grandma. But those of us who grew up in farming states remember something of what it was like when small family farms populated the countryside. We remember what it meant for small towns, for school systems, for local hospitals. We can also imagine what a state like Iowa or Ohio would look like if nearly all of the land were owned by agro-industrial businesses paying workers a minimum wage. Remember the text from Genesis. And so it was that all the land became Pharaoh's from one end of the empire to the next, making slaves of all the people. Well, this is what is happening in nearly every sector of the economy. The enclosure of land, the enclosure of goods, the enclosure of property among more and more people. Well, in God's economy, all people are given access to the necessary means for life. So we who claim to follow Jesus's radically inclusive love are called to work prophetically to organize for a public household in which the efficiencies of the private marketplace do not overtake the common goods of an inclusive society that works for all people. Of course, there's so much to be said here, right? But let me draw our attention to what this might look like on a more local small-scale model, thinking of your own congregations, perhaps. Christians, I would argue, ought to be participating in small-scale efforts, along with public advocacy work, to increase what Nobel Prize economist Eleanor Ostrom calls the common pool resources, through efforts like community gardens or land trusts that preserve woodlands or prairies or landscapes for public use and enjoyment. Why? Because the Jesus we follow makes room at the table for everyone. So I'm going to show some slides here from a course that I taught this past May in Chicago. Each day coupling some of these themes with visits to on-the-ground models that are living out some of these visions, perhaps in small ways, but I would argue important ways. So issues of land access. There are community gardens popping up everywhere. Community gardens showing up in church lots. Here we were at the Talking Farm in Skokie, Illinois, doing some soil preparation. Uh, it's an interesting model. It's a nonprofit that is working with the city of Skokie. Skokie had several acres of land that was being unused. It was a public park, but it had been overgrown with weeds. Nonprofit coupled with the city. And now we have got a growing, emerging uh, farm that's providing food for neighborhood residents, for some churches, for other nonprofit organizations. And just as importantly, this is a space where children, where youth, where elderly are gathering on almost a daily basis when it's warm uh, 
and creating community. So how might you, and I'm actually going to pause for just a bit and have you talk to, to someone next to you, how could you use church land or property of other ways? How could you use what you own in your homes, your yards, your deck? How might that be used to make the goods of the earth more available to more people? What might that look like? So just spend a minute or two talking to someone next to you. Imagine the land that you have access to. How could it be made available to others? All right, great conversation, energetic conversation. Let's pull back together. Because we're a bit, we're running a bit behind on time, and I want to make sure we help get back to the original schedule, I'm not going to do what I had anticipated, which was to, to hear some of the insights, the, the ideas that had, had arisen. But take them with you. Uh, share them with me later. Second question what bonds are formed around the table? Go ahead. The Holy Spirit joins everyone together in bonds of fellowship. The relationships that the Spirit weaves together around the table are deep and sustaining. For the Spirit binds diverse others together in bonds of genuine community. And so the theological affirmation is that God's holiness is present with us in the Holy Spirit as convivial love, convivere, to live with. The Spirit is the love shed abroad in our hearts, shared among each other. Blessed be the ties that bind, right? And so the table command here, as Paul says, is whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, let all that you do be done in love. So the relationships the spirit weaves are marked by love. To be faithful then to what the spirit is doing in our midst means first of all criticizing economic structures or arrangements of the household that are based in the fragmentation of relationships and communities. Now, the, the models here, the examples, are endless. I mean, think about our African-American communities in the 50s and 60s. Where did the interstates go in our urban centers? They divided communities right through the heart, usually right over Main Street. So 
the, the examples, the models are endless, but sticking with food here is representative. From an ecological perspective, a healthy ecosystem is a community. It's a natural area, a pond, a forest, a grassland, within which a whole community of plant, animal, and microorganism communities interact in such a way as to sustain the diversity of all life forms, a kind of integrated dance. Well, one of the chief strategies of industrial agriculture has been to separate, isolate, and then manipulate certain plant varieties or animal species or traits in order to amplify food production. I mean, think of monocrop corn across the entire state of Iowa and now across most of the Midwest, or soybeans. Driven by the logic of efficiency, economy of scale, modern agroeconomic policies have replaced small, highly diversified farms, which typically incorporate a whole variety of plants, animals, woodsheds, waterways, wildlife, have replaced all that with massive monocrop or livestock operations that focus on a singular part of the food economy. Modern industrial agriculture's primary strategy of increasing food production through the use of technologies such as large-scale machinery, synthetic nitrogen fer uh, fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides, as we know, directly contribute to many of today's ecological and health crises. Although they initially produced increased crop production worldwide, we're now starting to see yields not only plateau in many cases, but start to decline. These savior technologies have also been responsible for a 30% loss in the world's farmable land over the past 40 years, massive losses in biodiversity. Think here of the honeybee collapse disorder, as it's being called. The present release of over 25% of the world's CO2 emissions, 60% of all methane gas emissions, and 80% of nitrous oxide emissions, all major contributors, again, to a warming climate. So in the midst of an agroeconomy dependent upon the fragmentation of human communities and bonded ecosystems, Christians are called to abide in the convivial love of the Holy Spirit by participating in harmonious food systems like sustainable agriculture, permaculture or permanent agriculture, fair trade exchange, all of which foster the flourishing of all of the elements and participants gathered up in the daily bread we eat and the common cup we drink. So day two, go ahead. Our students visited a permaculture site. Permaculture being a holistic design approach which takes all of the potential elements of a landscape and designs and integrates them in ways so that each of the elements contributes to the flourishing of other elements. Go ahead. So that morning in class, we're talking about conviviality and how it's healing and brings beauty. And it sounds wonderful, and we're quoting Wendell Berry. But then in the afternoon, you're visiting a site, and the designer is talking about, you know, if you plant individual species and in rows, you've got soil issues, you've got pest issues, but if you weave them together in a guild of plants, think of the three sisters in Native American agriculture, corn, squash, beans, all working together harmoniously to build up soil, to repel pests, to literally live within each other, so you start to see this isn't just idyllic, this is Makes a lot of sense. Next one. Uh, incorporating urban agriculture. Uh, this is right in the heart of Chicago. Go ahead. Uh, 
This particular designer was uh, a bit of an expert at urban food foraging, uh, and there are many forms of that, of course, but, but this uh, uh, finding edible plants, here are plantains, go ahead, uh, native uh, uh, medicinal plant burdock root, uh, which I've just been mowing over, but now have discovered has a, has a great uh, purpose. Uh, urban garden right next to the, the L in Chicago, so uh, Sir Albert Howard, uh, one of the early uh, figures in sustainable agriculture said, healthy soil leads to healthy plants, leads to healthy people, uh, leads to healthy communities, leads to healthy nations. Uh, the health of the soil being so fundamental. Uh, here's a stop uh, on the Chicago red line. Uh, you see a parking lot. You start to imagine spaces that you wouldn't imagine being places of restoration, of community. Uh, certainly this is happening in Detroit, Cleveland, we're seeing it everywhere. Next one. Um, this quote from, from the prophet Jeremiah. It's precisely by seeking the welfare of the city, the salvation of the city, that we find our own salvation. So again, and we, I don't think we've got time this time to stop and uh, discuss, but imagine how could the spaces you have in your yard, container pots on your patio, parking lots at your church, land that farmers in your congregation own, how could these spaces be places of healing, of restoring the good creation? Third question, do the elements served nourish the body? God the Father, Mother nourishes our bodies with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. God's intention is for the earthly flourishing of the whole creation. In the Last Supper he shares with his disciples, Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. So God is given to us in the form of life-giving bread that sustains our bodies to do the work of God. And so the theological claim here is that God's holiness is offered to us as incarnate or enfleshed love, which nourishes our earthly life. And the table commandment then is that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So to be faithful to the God who nourishes our bodies means criticizing economic structures which prioritize the generation of abstract financial wealth over the real wealth of healthy human bodies, healthy communities, and vibrant ecosystems. One of the core fallacies of modern economic logic is precisely the denial of the primacy of land, of nature, in production. Rather than viewing the soil, air, water, the whole of the biosphere as fundamentally different than a manufactured product to be bought or sold in the marketplace, the presuppositions of the modern market treat nature as, at best, one potential commodity to be bought and sold, among others. But the natural world, the good creation, is not simply one amongst a list of possible goods, but the foundational precondition of all human activity. As climate change author Bill McKibben says, in thinking about the devastating effects of a perpetual growth economy, the earth is like a man who has suffered a stroke. It's still the same body, but about half of it doesn't function like it used to. Folks, we're seeing this unfold in our very midst if we have eyes to see, if we have ears to listen to the scientific consensus. 
The earth is struggling, is suffering, is moaning. Well, in God's economy, we taste and see that the Lord and all the Lord's creation are good. And that means working toward a sustainable economy made up of just jobs that sustain rather than deplete the earth's resources. It means listening to economists like Herman Daly, who proposes that all of our economic activities be integrated into the limits and the needs of creaturely existence on earth. It's time for us to heed thinkers like Wendell Berry, who for decades has been calling Christians to focus on our stewardship, to focus on good craftsmanship, sustainable production, and a much more intimate relationship to the earth as a proper form of worship. Next slide. Go to the next. So here we visit a place called The Plant. Has anyone heard of The Plant? South side of Chicago. Uh, former uh, back of the yards uh, pork plant, uh, which is now an off-grid zero waste business model. Go ahead. You can visit their site, plantchicago.com. Go ahead. Um, and the vision which is already emerging is that of an incubator for a range ecology of small businesses all within this space which are mutually supportive of one another and which provide jobs for neighborhood residents. Go ahead. Uh, the kind of jobs that can't easily be outsourced, right? We've seen the devastating effects of that throughout our urban centers. Go ahead. Now, they're, they're using practically all of the materials that can be used for reuse in the building. Go ahead. Go on. So a list of uh, dangers of our current agroeconomy. Go on. Uh, here we see uh, two different models of food production. <laughs> two different meals represented. <laughs> Go ahead. Urban beekeeping. Go ahead. Uh, raised bed, outdoor gardens, uh, future brewery. And maybe you don't put that in the church fellowship hall, right? <laughs> Although some of you may choose to. Uh, who am I to say? Um, so this is an anaerobic digester, which takes wastes from all of the small businesses and surrounding businesses, so it's actually less than zero <laughs> waste, um, feeds it into the digester, which then creates a biogas, which produces the energy, the lighting, the heating, the cooling for the entire building. Zero waste energy, zero carbon emissions. Go ahead. Here's one model of closed loop system, which uh, some of you are probably familiar with, aquaponics. Go ahead. So you've got tilapia, which produce ammonia and nitrates. Fish byproducts are then used to feed the plants. Plants grown under LED lights powered by the digester. Uh, the plants then filter and clean the water, which is then pumped back into the tanks, which is a pretty impressive system, right? So zero waste, closed systems. Imagine our churches being spaces of this kind of sustainable, integrated, not just thinking, but practices. Go ahead. Uh, here's a, you can get this online. This shows all of the different business models and how they loop in one to the next. Again, that's a question I would want to pose to you, but for the sake of time, let's, let's continue. Fourth question, how are the seats arranged? The God who is triune arranges dinner guests as co-equal companions. Those who participate in this meal are mutual servants of one another. Now here we recall Jesus' response to his disciples who are arguing over who will sit next to him at the messianic banquet. 
The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, he says, right? But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like one who serves. So theologically, we affirm that in the Holy Trinity, the divine holiness is shared as mutual love or cooperative love which flows out to the good creation so that we might love our neighbors as ourselves for the sake of the common good. And the table commandment then is each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. So here I would discuss the centralization of the agroeconomy, the consolidation of seed companies, the centralization of transnational agribusiness corporations, which now oversee nearly every aspect of the food system. Uh, let me just give you one uh, reference here. Bill Heffernan, who's a rural sociologist at the University of Missouri, says that fewer than six transnational food retailers will soon control the entire global food sector. Ultimately, he says, the same firms are involved in all stages of the food system, through ownership or through the development of a variety of strategic alliances to main, con maintain control from gene, which are thinking about genetically modified organisms, and the owning of life at the genetic level, all the way to the retail shelf six transnational corporations owning that entire process. Again, we're seeing this, and you know it, you see it in your communities, we're seeing this across the entire economy, all sectors. The last time our economy saw the rise of this kind of monopolistic power was, of course, the 1920s. And this is the economic context out of which this protest of the 99 and 1% has emerged. Well, in God's economy, power is shared equally. All share and enjoy the goods of creation through cooperative relationships, not relationships of domination, control, and oppression. So conforming ourselves to the image and likeness of the triune God today must include participating actively in the upbuilding of local economies, of economies based in real relationships between neighbors. It's not an accident that local food is at the heart of the new economy movement, food that is grown locally and that nurtures relationships both between farmers and consumers. Christians today need to be supporting of the creation of more worker-owned, democratically governed business cooperatives in which workers, managers, and administrators share profits equitably. We ought to be working at them. Our churches and our seminaries and our institutions ought to reflect a bit more of those principles. We ought to be investing in them, sending our children to learn from them. Why? Because the triune God whom we worship arranges the seats so that everyone at the table joins in mutual service of one another. Let's turn to the slides. Go to the next one. So here we visited the Dill Pickle. It's a food cooperative. Uh, there are food cooperatives in every or most major urban centers. This, surprisingly, is the only one currently in Chicago, though there's a host of them uh, emerging. Milwaukee, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, are places to look. Um, begins with a single individual who had an idea, said, we, we need a food co-op in the neighborhood, and now has over 1,300 consumer co-owners. So food co-ops support local farmers who benefit from the direct support of people and earth-minded consumers. In a fast food nation where one in three Americans and one in two minorities born after 2000 will develop 
type 2 diabetes, ensuring access for all communities to fresh organic produce would be our sanest national health care plan. Healthy, happy animals mean healthy, happy eaters. We're not going to get into meat eating, vegetarianism, veganism uh, today. Uh, local milk, uh, fair trade coffee, go ahead, go on. Uh, they've been so successful, uh, they're currently looking for a larger retail space while wanting to maintain intimate embedded connection with the neighborhood. Uh, fair trade bananas. Uh, so the vision is not that there's no coffee because you can't grow coffee in your particular part of the world, but it's that uh, those it everything that can be grown locally ought to be grown locally, and those items which we need to export, import, are with other communities which are doing likewise to support and build up communities and neighbors. Go ahead. Uh, next one. Uh, a worker-owned, uh, governed uh, uh, t-shirt uh, from, from Mexico. Uh, we were there for just maybe an hour, and in that time span, uh, probably 25, 30 folks from the neighborhood were in and out. Uh, and it was precisely a place of communal gathering. How did your hip surgery, places like the church, how, how did the hip surgery turn out? Uh, how are your kids doing? When's your daughter coming back from college? Uh, the mom and pop store of, 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 of old that people say, eh, you're being nostalgic. That, that's, that's back in the day. Uh, not in Logan Square, Chicago, it's not. Uh, go ahead. Um, and here again, this emphasis upon local with an X. So, from here then, we went to, um, uh, go to the next slide, uh, the United Methodist Church in Logan Square to meet, to discuss, go ahead. Uh, and we talked to the local pastor who surprisingly was saying many of the same things about wanting to connect with the community, about wanting to build up relationships in the community, wanting to serve the community, be embedded in a place. So there's a lot of interesting connections between this cooperative model and what this church is trying to do. Next one. Uh, and so someone asked the, the general manager uh, if spirituality has anything to do with her work. And what she said was, nourishing a community is the most meaningful thing I've ever done. Yes, absolutely. Can I get an amen? amen. Five, and then we'll quit. In whose name is the meal blessed? We who are Christian bless our table fellowships in the name of the Lord our God. And the Lord gives us permission to begin the Messianic banquet feast already here and now. Already in this present age, the reign of God's eternal holiness breaks forth as creative love. Gracious, convivial, enfleshed, mutual, and creative love. Our mission is to participate now in the age that is to come. Here we remember that the primary images of the coming kingdom of God is that of a messianic feast. We remember that it was Jesus' own table practices which enfleshed his proclamation, the kingdom of God is near. We remember that as many New Testament scholars have said, it was Jesus' table practices that got him killed. Are our table practices that radical that we're stirring up the powers that be to say, what are they doing in those church fellowship halls? That's really disruptive. That's really subversive. Well, there's no better starting point for those seeking to support the emergence of a new economic reality than with the food economy. It's not the whole, but it's a great place to start. The decision is clearly concentrated in two very different meal gatherings, as we've seen, the agribusiness meal and the banquet feast of God's holy love. The reality is that because a few, a very few private corporations control nearly everything that we eat, unless we're willing to seek out and support the few alternatives that exist, and here I'm quoting Marion Nessel, who wrote a book called Food Politics. Unless we do so, 
We support the current food system with every bite we take. So what future do you want for the earth, for your communities, for your children, your children's children? Well, having been liberated to begin the kingdom feast already now, Christians are free. We are set free to participate in new models already. According to Indian agrarian activist Vandana Shiva, small-scale direct responses are necessary in periods of totalitarian rule, totalitarian rule, precisely because large-scale structures and processes are controlled by the dominant power. And so she points to seeds, to rivers, to our daily food as sites for reclaiming political and social power. Slide. I have for the next one. So on this last day, uh, we headed down to Fuller Park, uh, south side of Chicago, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the metro area, riddled with decades of racism, uh, loss of access to political power in the Chicago area political system, uh, many of the dynamics that we see in so many inner city communities. Next one. Um, and the, uh, the crime, the gain activity that flows out of those conditions. Next. So one of the things that, that we all know that happens in these communities is uh, a lot of toxic waste, uh, what's called environmental racism. Uh, it's not in uh, North Shore neighborhoods like Wilmette uh, where uh, wastes are dumped. Uh, and so what uh, Michael Howard, who we'll meet here in a bit, or his son, uh, discovered was incredibly high concentrations of lead in the parking lots where children were playing. And high concentrations of lead lead to all kinds of learning disabilities uh, which were showing up in the school system, at home, in the neighborhood. Uh, go ahead. So here is his son, Troy, uh, telling the story of how his father, Michael, a uh, Baptist layperson, uh, all rooted deeply in his faith, uh, had a vision of what to do with his brownfield next to one of the train tracks. Go ahead. Uh, so he found a place called Eden Place, Go ahead. which now provides environmental instruction to neighborhood children and youth. Oh. <coughs> Well, <laughs> so uh, he's used he's used Eden Place, uh, which is now well. Here we go. Um, yeah, go ahead and scroll all the way toward toward the bottom. This, uh, this PowerPoint has probably been more trouble than it's worth. Uh, keep going up, keep going up. Uh, a little bit more. Okay, uh, the very top one, click on that. Okay, and then go, go to the next, sorry. Uh, as Michael said, at first folks in the neighborhood said, ecology is a white thing. He said, no, it is a human thing. Go ahead. So Howard's mission has been to help children see and experience nature and beauty right in their community. We're using the green outdoors to fight poverty, apathy, racism, violence, and indifference. People now refer to this place as the miracle on 43rd place. When asked what it's been like to be part of his father's vision, uh, whether his faith relates to what he does, Troy said, in so many ways, it's just about being a warm-spirited person relating to people where they are, making them laugh. It's all in the name of the Lord. So in recent years, Eden Place now is providing jobs for uh, area neighbors who are now making a living selling produce at areas farmer, area farmers markets. In food deserts where people don't have access to healthy foods, high rates of obesity and other health-related issues compound struggles against poverty, crime, and racism. You know the story. Good whole food is a human right. 
right? Yes. Access to the restorative powers of nature is a human right. So uh, you're not going to be able to write down this link here, but if you're curious to see about a 10, 15 minute uh, kind of video link, uh, go to WTTW and do a search on the website uh, for Eden Place or Michael Howard, and then get on the solar bus. So that day we, uh, we weeded the raised beds. We don't, we'll quickly go through these. Um, let me just point out, this was day five of a class that met from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. This is the last few hours on Friday. You would expect to see exhausted faces. Um, let me show you what happens when we get out of our buildings and enjoy and participate in the restorative powers of nature. So just click through these. Even that guy was happy. <laughs> so I took the weeds, uh, added it to, uh, to some straw, carbon to create new soil. Uh, all right, let me stop there. Um, the question that I want you to take from this last table practice or commandment is this. How might you proceed from here to eat and drink in ways that seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. How will you embody within your local church, within your home, within your neighborhoods, within your communities, how will you embody our common prayer that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? I apologize we haven't had more time for interaction, but I think we're moving now to a, a time of, of Dr. Tyler and I uh, being available for, for dialogue. So I'll, I'll wait for that, uh, for that section, but let's, let's close with a, a final prayer. Who is fit to hold power and worthy to act in God's place? Those with a passion for the truth, who are horrified by injustice, who act with mercy to the poor and take up the cause of the helpless, who have let go of selfish concerns and see the whole earth as sacred, refusing to exploit her creatures or to foul her waters and lands. Their strength is in their compassion. God's light shines through their hearts. Their children's children will bless them and the work of their hands will endure. May it be so for us and for all. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm not sure how the, the next transition goes. Is it break time? Is that right? Sure. sure. Tim says sure. <laughs>